Welcome. Hello. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're going to give it just 20 seconds here for folks to come in for the, from the waiting room. Join us uh, for today's webinar. I see some familiar faces popping on the screen. Uh, hello to all of you. Um, thanks for joining us for today's webinar. Um, really excited for today's content. Uh, I'm Meredith Badler. I'm the Deputy Director at the CBCA, the Colorado Business Committee for the Arts. And today we are partnering with our friends at the Kite and Dart Group um, for a conversation about relational marketing, uh, what we have cleverly or they have cleverly called strangers to super fans. I feel like we all want and need super fans, particularly artists and creatives, um, but really anyone sort of in the small business entrepreneurial space. So that's what we'll be diving into for today's content. Uh, this webinar is part of a programming series we have at CBCA called Advancing Creatives. It's all of our professional development and business skills trainings for artists and creative entrepreneurs. And I just wanna thank uh, support from the Kenneth King Foundation and the Ent Credit Union um, who helped to support us uh, providing uh, our advancing creative content. Um, I know our two speakers, Kayla and Zach, um, have some other housekeeping items, but just some quick things uh, for those, watch those watching live uh, with us right now on Zoom. You are muted when you first entered. Please stay muted um, for most of the conversation just to avoid background noise. Um, we encourage you to use your chat feature. Go ahead, find that right now, and introduce yourself. I, I see a bunch of names and familiar faces, but our speakers may not. Um, so share who you are, maybe what you do, and why you joined today. Uh, we do also have closed captioning available. You should see that. Um, on the bottom of your Zoom screen, Zoom screen um, to see uh, subtitles. You can turn that on or off if you need to. Um, and that is what's being live streamed. So no, we are not live streaming right now on our Facebook page. Our closed captioning is live streaming um, to the service that we use so we can provide that option. Um, and we are also recording today's webinar. So if you are watching this later at home or on YouTube, hello to you. And we're so glad uh, you found your way to this content and hope you find it useful. Um, for those joining us right now, we will be uh, also sending out an email following today's webinar, usually in the next day or two, with a link to that recording so you can watch it again or share it with your friends. Um, and there'll also be a short evaluation survey uh, with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my little welcome slide here and turn it over to our friends, Kayla Wright and Zach Dunn uh, with the Kite and Dart Group, which is a um, wonderful organization uh, based here in Colorado to talk to talk us through today's content. Please engage with them, ask them questions, share your comments in the chat. Uh, they are here for you and we are really excited. So take it away. That was an awesome intro. Would you like to come to all of our events, Meredith, like every single one of them? <laughs> yes, I would be happy to. Great. Awesome. Thank you. You're hired. Um, <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to Strangers to Superfans, the Artist Guide to Relational Marketing. Um, just really quickly, we at Kite and Dart have a set of agreements that we always go over at the beginning of our workshops that I just like to run through really quickly and get out of the way. Um, we request that you close out all other windows just to be nice and present during this webinar today. Mute when you're not talking, use I and not you statements, mostly just so that I don't get confused. Um, and then we ask that you reflect, don't project. And in this space, we like to use oops and ouch statements. If you say something that came out wrong or if I say something that came out wrong, uh, feel free to retract that, adjust. Same goes for ouch. If Zach says something I don't like, I'll tell him <laughs> and I'll let him, <laughs> I'll let him amend it. Um, make space, take space. If you're someone that doesn't like to speak up in the room, we request that you take space if you feel like it. If you're someone that has a super easy time speaking up, we request that you sit back and allow space for others. 
um, listen from does this apply and not have I heard this before. Zach and I think about marketing a little bit differently. So we would just love for you to take on these new ideas. Um, use the chat and then as you know, you'll be, we are recording and it's not live streamed to YouTube. That's for our workshops, not this one. And without further ado, <laughs> my name is Kayla Wright. I'm the director of marketing um, and I specialize in social media over here at Kite and Dart. Um, and then Zach Dunn is right here for me and I'll let him introduce himself. <laughs> Thanks, Kayla. Uh, I'm Zach Dunn. I'm the lead copywriter over at Kite and Dart. Um, so writing is kind of my game. I also do um, uh, a bit of fiction in my spare time. So really excited to get to be in a room with a bunch of other creatives and artists today to talk about, you know, how we actually go about turning the things that we make into things that people consume. Awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah. And then just real quick, the Kite and Dart group is a business consulting group. Uh, we work with entrepreneurs. Um, from all levels, from conception to, you know, when they have a bunch of employees, we also do work with artists. Our founder is a DJ. So we have that all in and around our organization. We just recently grew our marketing division. So now we have a team of five people. It's really cool. It's super fun. Um, and we're just really excited to be here with y'all today. So thank you so much for coming and listening to me and Zach talk. <laughs> so Zach, Oh, I forgot about this. I forgot about this slide, y'all. Sorry, I was going to turn it over to Zach, but I changed my mind. So um, just a few things that you can expect from us. Consent, we always ask if someone wants to be coached before we dive right into coaching them. Um, activism, we just have unconventional opinions about business. So we just request that you try that on. Uh, contribution, we really just want to make the biggest difference that we can in our communities. So thank you all for being here and allowing us to do that. And then transformation, like I said, we say some weird stuff about business. So again, we just request that you're curious and you try it on in this space. Okay, now, Zach. Perfect. Dive right, thanks in. for teeing that up for me, Kayla. You're welcome. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, really the way I'd like to jump off here today, um, I'd love to have a, an opportunity here to hear from some of you. Um, and thank you all for everybody who kind of introduced themselves briefly in the chat. Uh, looks like we have a cool blend of people who are here today between musicians, chefs, visual artists. Um, I think somebody runs a gallery or a collective, um, if I saw that correctly. Um, so it's great. I love having a good blend of people from different uh, backgrounds and professions here. Um, and I wanted to start off today by talking about something that's been kind of bumbling around in my head a little bit. Um, I mentioned earlier, I'm a writer, I actually recently finished working on a novel. Um, and, and it's got me thinking kind of as, um, you know, as creatives, as we move from this step of, of creating things and actually building this thing to actually putting it out in the world, um, that creates all these emotions and all these problems and challenges that we run into, um, especially when you're trying to stand out um, amid this avalanche of all this other content, trying to reach consumers that are actually going to be impacted by what you built, or whether that's actually searching for, you know, what I call the middlemen, whether it's publishers, studios, um, manufacturers, labels, those kind of people who help, um, whose job it is to connect artists with the people who consume the art. Um, and it's left me thinking about this question of like, what is the actual goal as an artist or a creative? Um, you know, what, what is our end goal outside of, you know, we obviously make these things, but then we have, it comes to time to put them into the world. Um, and for me, I've been asking myself this question, you know, how many people do you need to impact for the blood, sweat, and tears that you put into this project to actually be worth it? Is it, is one person enough? Is it a dozen? Is it a hundred? Um, and I'd love to turn it over uh, to you all um, to, if this is a, a question that you've asked yourself or thought about, um, how do you define that for yourself? What does success look like for you as an artistic entrepreneur? Have you asked yourself that question of, you know, how many people do you need to impact for it to have been, you know, worth it, quote unquote? Mm. Renee with the thousand true fans reference. Absolutely. We're totally going to touch on that. Is it, do you think it is a thousand though, Renee? Is that, does that seem like that's the number that matters to you the most is if you hit a thousand, does that feel like you, like you, like it was enough, like you did what you were supposed to do? Anybody else? Because I know we all come from this um, one person. If it's the right person, that's a great answer, Jim. Um, 
Yeah, and I, I think it's just a, an interesting thought experiment, especially since we come from um, so many different backgrounds. You know, I, I, believe, I think we have some people who work in the culinary arts in here, and obviously, um, impacting people with your food, since every meal is you know handmade essentially, that makes this whole um, it changes the, the scale of the question quite a bit um, compared to if you're somebody who's creating music and that's something that's easily, um, you know, uh, dispersable, let's say. You can reach a lot of people without, um, you know, excessive uh, elbow grease, let's say. Um, cool, it's good to know that everybody's actually been thinking about this. Um, and, and somebody mentioned a thousand true fans there, which I think is a great point and is a really good segue for us. Um, because that's really what it comes down to is, is the goal, um, is how many followers do we actually need to you know, be successful in our industry? Um, and if we're defining success, we can look at it a couple of different ways. Um, you know, some people get into the creative arts because they're attracted to that idea of fame and fortune. Um, but I get the sense from a lot of the, the question or the answers to that question I saw pop up in the chat is that for most of us here, we're more, more interested in being able to make a living, doing something that we love, that actually is gonna make a real difference for, for people in the world. Um, so really, unless you're trying to be, you know, the next Justin Bieber or, or whoever, you don't really need hundreds and millions of followers to, to be successful. Um, and now one thing that I think about here and, and that I, I run into, and I'd be curious to see if anybody else comes up against this, um, is this transition from, creating something and, and putting a bit of yourself into this tangible thing to actually selling it to people can feel like this kind of weird um, conflict. There's a dichotomy there in, in sort of the pure act of creation to then actually selling to people. Um, and something that, that I've thought about and through my work with Kite and Dart has, has really resonated with me and I hope will help anybody else in the room who's experiencing something similar is this idea of contribution that um, it's important to kind of divorce yourself from the frame of, you know, I'm ex just exchanging this thing I made for somebody's money. That what you're doing by actually doing this creative act and creating something can have a real positive, tangible impact in someone's life. Um, you know, I think about all the different works, um, you know, the books and the movies and the things that I've consumed that have had a huge positive impact on me. It's always important for me to try to anchor myself and remind myself that the work we do can have a really big impact on somebody. And like Jim said, you know, if it impacts one person, the right person that makes a big difference, you know, that's an incredible thing you've done for someone's life. Um, but then the trick is actually finding those people, right? Who it's really gonna make a big difference for. Um, and bring, coming back to that idea of a thousand true fans that, um, you know, if you're not familiar with this, um, the idea is that if you're just trying to make a living, um, as an artist, you know, you're, you're not looking for, you know, your name up in lights and all the awards and all that. If you just want to be able to do what you love and be sustained by it, um, you really only need a thousand people who really, really resonate with it. If you can get a thousand fans in the world who are diehard fans, or super fans, we like to call them. Um, and if they contribute, you know, if you make enough content for them to realistically give you a hundred dollars a year that's a one hundred thousand dollar a year salary that you're making which for most of us is a very comfortable living um and that for me is a, is an interesting way to kind of overcome that problem of, of how do we find an audience and how do we connect with people and know that we're actually making a difference um and the thing that i love and that really inspires me is that um you know if you actually look at the math and you think that the craziest most out there idea um if that's only interesting to one in a million people which is a really low bar, one in a million, that is actually 7,000 people worldwide that love what you do and, and will be seriously impacted and affected by the work that you do. So if you can find even a fraction of those 7,000 people, you have an audience in the world somewhere for what you're doing, no matter what it is, whether it's art, the craziest food, the wackiest stories, the most you know niche, unique music, there's people in the world who want it, need it, and will respond to it. Um, so the trick is is finding these super fans and connecting with them. Um, and I'm gonna throw it over to Kayla, our social media and marketing expert, to talk a little bit about what it actually takes to find these people. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, so we always like to set context here at the Kite and Dark group 
because sometimes when we jump into these conversations without any context, we find it's less powerful. Um, so why, why build these relationships? Which is interesting because I feel like in a room full of creatives and artists, that's a no brainer. I, I have a hunch that most of y'all kind of have an answer to this question, but building relationships allows you to shift your goal from let's say a thousand super fans to 500 people that are following you on Instagram and think you're the bee's knees. And so by building those relationships, you can actually work in smaller numbers because you have these super fans, you have these people that are diehards for you and your work. Now I'm someone that when I find something that I like, everyone around me knows about it. And it becomes a name that they hear all the time. It's like, okay, Kayla, we get it. Like you like your KitchenAid mixer, okay. But that's really the way that I am. And so the second I find something that I like, it, and that's a bad example, because obviously I don't have a relationship with anybody at KitchenAid, but you see my point. Um, the second you start to build these relationships with individuals, they start telling people, oh, I found this artist, I found this singer, I found this culinary artist that you know, does this amazing thing, here, have a look. And so that takes some of the work off of your plate as an artist of going out and finding those new people. You create a following of people that inevitably will bring people like into the fold as it were. So building relationships is actually just a really efficient way to market. It's an efficient way to get people on your side. And it's a great way to connect with people in a community that care about the same things as you. So then is a little bit of how do we build these relationships? And at the Kite and Dart group, we have something called source commitments, which are essentially the values that you stand in on a daily basis. So we encourage people to speak super openly about that. So I would encourage each and every one of you to really sit down and think about one, what the impact you want, your art and creativity or creations or whatever it is that you are marketing. I want you to sit down and think about the impact that you want that to have. And that can be one of your source commitments. I want you to sit down and think about what you're looking to create with this art. So are you looking to create like a future for your own self. It's okay if these source commitments are selfish. It doesn't have to be like, oh, I want my artwork to change the world, which I'm sure all of you do, but you can have source commitments that are also like, I want my art to support me. I want to live inside of my passion, inside of my truth. That's totally okay. And so through doing this exercise, you're gonna come up with a list of values that then the content that you start producing clearly portrays and will allow people that have aligned values to connect with you on a really deep and personal level. This will allow people to see how you are in your day-to-day -day life. It gives people this window and they fall in love with you and what you care about instead of just seeing one of your pieces, thinking, you know, let's say, oh my gosh, that would be so great for, you know, this big wall in my house, I'm gonna buy it. Now this person's in love with you as an artist and thinks I'm going to purchase this painting and I'm gonna tell everyone that walks through my house about it. So that's the deeper rooted connection. It's where people start to care about you and your mission and they wanna support you on that journey. And then you don't have to go out and find new people to buy from you or to support you or to fall in love with your music. You've got an army of other humans that love you, love what you're doing, spreading that for you. And I think, that's a perfect segue into yeah, connecting with your audience. We talked about that into cultivating content in your process, which I'm going to flip back over to Zach for because mm -hmm. he's he's the artist <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> Thanks, Kayla. Um, before we get into that, um, I'd love to maybe pause the lecture section of this for a minute um, and hear from you all in the crowd, so to speak. Um, is any of this resonating? Um, have, you know, Renee, you, you mentioned specifically um, 1,000 true fans in the chat. Um, is this a model you have experience with? Um, I'd love to just kind of throw it on if anybody wants to turn on their mic or their camera and talk a little bit about um, what, if you've gone through this process at all or thought about any of these things, any um, conclusions that's brought up or experiences you have with it. I kind of want to turn it over to you all for a little bit. Let's do it. 
trying to achieve an interested implementation strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Michelle. Hi, I resonated with what when Kayla was saying, if your mission is selfish, that that's okay. Um, Cause I don't think mine is because my mission is to build healthier communities through uh, culinary nutrition. Um, but with that said, I would love to um, also make money <laughs> as I help to build these communities. So it's just a fun and different way to look at it. So thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, we run into that all the time is this this idea of, you know, is it okay to want to make money and still want to make a difference? And the answer is absolutely. It's way easier to make a difference when you're not, you know, worrying where your next meal is going to come from. That's a funny little dichotomy that I think I'm sure most of us have run into. Is that Does anybody else experience that at all? We always like to say here at the Kite and Dart group that when you're a mission-driven business, your revenue is a direct reflection of the impact that you're able to have. And by reframing it that way, it doesn't feel like you're like so greedy, you know, because so many people mission driven don't want to admit that they want to make money. But like making money is a really good thing. It means you're making an impact. Mm -hmm. Jim, so the time is a finite resource and organizing time for everything. Sometimes you mean you have to know and ask for help. That's a really, really good point. Um, and that's the thing about this too, trying to cultivate um, all these, all these super fans. Um, it's, I'm not gonna lie, it's a time consuming process. Um, now there's, there's benefits and, and drawbacks to it as well that um, I think when you look at, when you look at kind of the difference between, you know, just speaking from my experience, the difference between, you know, self-publishing a book and going through a traditional publishing house. Um, if you go through a traditional publishing house or, you know, one of these middlemen, if you're a musician, if you're going through a studio or a label or anything like that, um, it does create a little bit of a barrier between you and your audience um, in a couple of different ways. Um, a, specifically that some of the, um, the money that your super fans are contributing to you, you know, if you're going through a middleman like that, they're going to be taking a large portion of what those funds look like. But on the other hand, you know, if you're somebody who maybe this model isn't a great fit for, you'd rather just focus on, you know, the work that you do and let somebody else handle the relationships and the the building of that audience that's a good route too but it takes a you know orders of magnitude more volume to really make that work um so that is a good thing if you got to know where do you like to spend your energy where are your talents at um you know if that's something that is not a perfect fit for you that makes perfect sense um i would love to address the two questions that that are in the do. chat back if that works for you um lee i really like your question about ultra high-end fine art? And I think the answer to that is when you're looking at things in way larger price points, it's not so much about what your Instagram looks like. It's about the relationships that you are building and cultivating. So I think while it might be possible to find those people just by having, you know, that thousand super fans on Instagram. It's more important in that sense to build your relationships through networking. That could easily be done online through conversations with people, but it, it's something that is going to take, like Zach said before, elbow grease. It's not, attraction marketing works really, really, really well up to those bigger price points. And then people want to know personally who they're spending their money with and you can attract those people certainly but then you have to find a way to take that relationship and move it into a more personal setting so whether that's you know in the dms whether that's through phone calls whether that's through art gallery showings things like that it just it can start there but i think for those types of relationships that you're referring to it's definitely requires that more personal touch. Mm -hmm. Would you and agree that? Take you back off that a little bit too. Um, one of the interesting things about this, Lee, is when you look at, because um, when we talk about a thousand fans, uh, the a thousand fans is a kind of this baseline model of if you get a thousand people to give you a hundred dollars a year, you're going to be doing just fine. Now, if we're talking about um, high, ultra high-end fine art, 
um, clearly we're talking orders of magnitude larger than $100 a year. So if you're thinking about it in that way where, you know, I'm not going to pretend I'm in the uh, high end art game, so I can't even begin to uh, guess what these numbers are looking like. But let's even say on the super low end that, you know, you're looking at like average of a thousand dollars a transaction. Well, at that point, you only need a hundred fans um, who are as interested in that. Now, obviously, this is something that, you know, if you're making the fine art versus being um, a proprietor or, you know, sort of a salesman of it. Um, it changes a little bit, but you get to kind of play with the math and see where's your ideal income, how much are your um, super fans willing to spend in a year on this kind of thing, um, and it lets you play with the math and play with those sliders a little bit to see kind of what you need to be putting out and what needs to be coming in to make it work. So I hope that makes sense. Um, Elizabeth. You had a great question how to reach a broad, broad enough spectrum of viewers to find those super fans. This is such an awesome question. I love this question. You don't want to think about reaching a broad number of people. I know that sounds weird, right? We talked about the numbers game a second ago, but the thing is when you're trying to talk to a bunch of people, you end up speaking to no one in particular. So what I mean by that is you have to stand in those values we just talked about from the very beginning because you don't want people to be surprised by you. So you don't want to essentially bring people in based off of a more superficial version of your work because you're trying to reach more people and then they get into the fold and they're like, oh, this person's not at all who I thought they were or whatever. And it doesn't necessarily have to be horrible. You know what I mean? But to speak to a large audience is a lot of times way less powerful than to stand in your values. So we always talk about becoming polarizing. And if you care about anything, you are automatically polarizing. If you care, if you're passionate about a single topic, like I personally am passionate about animals, specifically horses. I meet people that really don't like horses and it makes me polarizing. <laughs> so it's just, um, it's something to think about. Like it, it is so, you know, there are some people that really like sunlight and there are other people that prefer like super cloudy days. So if you care about anything, you're polarizing and through that polarization, you're going to obviously attract people you're gonna repel people, but we don't wanna talk about that. You're gonna attract people by doing that. And if you're just trying to talk to the masses without a whole lot of heart and values behind it, you end up not really talking to anybody, if that answers your question. Uh, part of what we were talking about here is, um, A, this idea of being able to connect directly um, with this audience. Um, and we live in a really cool time where that is, um, pretty much easier than ever, especially with resources and platforms like Patreon and like Kickstarter, where once you find those fans, um, they have the opportunity to support you directly, which, you know, coming back to it, to my whole thing, part of that feels a little bit odd, almost like almost, um, I, I, almost, I get this body sensation of it almost feels like I'm taking advantage of somebody. And again, it's important to remember how the contribution that you're making and the feeling that super fans get from being able to support you. There's this really, there's this sense of importance and of contribution from their end when they know that somebody who they admire and who's making a difference in their life, um, they're supporting their ability to do more of what they love. Um, part of that though, is that I think you owe your super fans a little bit of extra content and a little bit of um, just extra juice than what your regular fans are going to get. Mostly because your super fans are doing a huge amount of your marketing for you. Like Kayla said, um, when you really love something and are passionate about it, I will tell everybody I know about it. Um, and you can see the way that this, this kind of spreads out. Um, as I was kind of preparing for this last week, I was thinking about where do I see um, this in real life? You know, in, in my sphere, what have I noticed? Um, and there's a couple different locations that I think this pops up in. Um, a, when you're making this kind of extra content for your super fans, you know, if you're a 
a chef, maybe that's early access to, you know, your newest menu tasting. If you're a musician, maybe it's bonus tracks that didn't make your last EP. You know, if you're a writer, maybe it's, you know, short stories or deleted scenes. Um, but how can you give the people who really love what you do a little bit of extra um, something that makes it feel like their patronage of you is, is giving something back to them in return? Um, and I think one of those things is a feeling of personal connection, um, of being able to engage directly with your audience, whether it's Q and A's, um, you know, ask me anything posts, um, threads that allow them to connect with you directly. Cause that's how you're going to build and maintain that relationship. Um, and I thought about two very polar different examples of, I think two of the most successful, um, kind of creators and artists in their specific industries. Um, one of those is Brandon Sanderson, who is um, a fantasy writer who's from Nebraska um, and is a New York Times bestseller on, I don't know how many books. Um, but one thing I noticed that seems to make his fans so rabid is his um, constant communication and direct line of, um, just this clear line of communication that he keeps with his fans, whether that's distinctly telling them, hey, I finished another chapter on this book, you know, we're X amount closer to being done, to popping up on, you know, specific fan and community threads to answer questions and, you know, give updates on when things are coming. Um, it makes people feel like they have a direct relationship with this person they otherwise wouldn't. And those are the kind of people who are, you know, supporting every Kickstarter, are, you know, the top level Patreons and people like me who will tell all their friends and family, hey, you have to go read this book. And when you think about that on a large scale, even developing one super fan like me who has gotten, I think, six other people interested in this, like that creates this whole kind of ripple and web that spreads out from there. And there's some real power in that. Um, another one I was reading, um, I, I think I was on um, Forbes or something like that. Um, and I was reading about, you know, this is about as far away from a fantasy writer from Nebraska we can get. BTS, the South Korean boy band, has, you know, they set all kinds of records on Billboard this summer and all that. I know Kayla's laughing her ass off over there. But one thing that I noticed um, is, you know, for a group that's responsible for, what is it, $5 billion in South Korea's GDP, which is insane, um, I think they still take time every week to individually sit down and do Q&As with their fans on live streams, um, which is crazy. When you think about reaching this level of uh, this scale of fame to still do that um, almost seems sort of quaint, but I think it's so responsible for getting both of these groups or, you know, people or artists to where they are that they realize how important it is that they continue to do it. Um, and Kayla mentioned something earlier about when you're cultivating this content, a lot of what I was just talking about is simply these artists um, sort of recording what they've been doing and journaling and blogging, talking about where they're at in the creative process. But when you make your fans a part of that, it, it makes them invest so much more into what the outcome is going to be and not only gets them excited for it, but also gets them to tell other people about it. And it's just this domino effect of kind of relational one-to-one -one word of mouth marketing that, you know, you can really do just by documenting your process and spending time talking to the people who consume it. You think I covered that well? Did that make sense? Did that resonate with anybody? Nope, everyone's gone. Nope. I don't, I don't <laughs> <what I'm saying. laughs> so yeah. I mean, I, oh, go ahead, Kayla, please. Oh, I was just going to share some other kind of ideas for how to build this into your own processes. Um, but Zach, if you wanted to continue on, on your no, that's great. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Um, so we have an amazing human being that works with us. Her name is Karen Hibner, and she is fascinated by this idea of cultivating versus creating content and I think um in the way of artists people are people like me who are not like I can't draw I'm an okay cook it never turns out looking pretty um I like baking but it never turns out looking nice I tried painting didn't work uh I made one sculpture one time and it fell apart so for people like me that are not artistically inclined like I the idea of putting together an, an entire song blows my mind I have no concept of creating something like that so seeing 
the actual artistic process that somebody goes through is crazy to me and something that I would follow like a diehard. And it can feel, I think for some people, like in, it's intrusive to share that. So I wanna point out that if you feel that way, don't make that the center of your strategy because you won't do it. It won't feel good. You won't have fun with it. If you are like, I love talking to people that are interested in stuff like this, hop on lives and make that your focus. Like cultivating content, you shouldn't should on yourself. You shouldn't sit there and say, I should take pictures of this point, but it feels really personal and intimate and I'm not prepared to share that. Or I should do this. Don't sit here and try and force yourself into a box. As artists, y'all have different different points of your process that maybe feel like something you do not want to share. And I just want everyone to know that Zach and I are not sitting here telling you to break down all those walls and like share everything and bury your soul. It's more of find what you, what you're excited about sharing with people. So maybe I would consider, I would encourage each of you to consider sitting down and thinking about your process. You don't have to write it all out, but think about it. And think about what parts of your process you feel like you would, you would like to share that you haven't shared so far. And then just build in this content cultivation. You're already doing it. So stop and take a picture. That's what we mean by cultivating content. Use what you're already doing and what you already have. Don't go out of your way to create a brand new process so that you can document the whole thing. Maybe all you do is set up a camera and a tripod with you in the kitchen. And you don't have to talk to it. You just, you know, film yourself doing whatever you're doing and then fast forward it, you know, or it's things like maybe you're going to the farmer's market. I don't know why I'm talking directly at Michelle right now, but I am. Maybe you're going to the farmer's market and you just film that whole thing the whole time. And you talk about why you make different choices and educate people, you know, things like that, where that's just, that's part of your process and you're comfortable and excited to share it. So you can look at what you do, what you feel is unique, and just build in documenting it. And then if you're like, but Kayla, I hate touching social media. There's some platforms that you can go to. Later.com is my personal favorite. I think it's great for creatives. And you can just schedule that stuff out. It doesn't have to be in real time. If you're someone that does good with scheduling, if you're someone that would rather just snap a picture and post it right away, Awesome, that works too. There's so many different, there's not one right way to do this. And now I'm gonna get off my soapbox. <laughs> I, think, I think you're absolutely right though, Kayla, that um, that is part of what your fans are gonna love about you is your unique idiosyncrasies. You know, they don't want somebody who, you know, follows whatever corporate playbook exists for this is how artists should appear on social media. The more genuine you can be about who you are, what you're doing, how you approach your process, you know, it's going to help push away the people that aren't going to, you know, respond to your stuff and bring closer to those fans who really, really do. Um, let's see. Oh, I like that. Ooh, great that's question. That's such a good question. <laughs> um, hmm, that's a really, I'd be interested to hear what other people think about this. Um, so, Lee asked as far as, um, as we're talking about the importance of authenticity um, and sort of that layer that emerges between you and your audience when you use a moniker or a pen name or something like that, um, which is really, really interesting. Um, so I'm reading this series right now, um, which is written by um, one author, James S.A. Corey, who is actually two different individuals who, uh, writing partners who write together. Um, and I'll admit that that, you know, when I think about that, um, there does seem to be this level of like mystery and almost disconnect in there. Um, but I think that, you know, my gut reaction to this is that um, if you're using a moniker like that, um, in my mind, I would equate it almost to like the name of a band, you know, you don't, because a band, you know, has its own overarching name that makes their brand recognizable. Um, I don't think that really puts that much space um, between you and the members of the band. Um, you know, I don't know what Prince's real name is, but I think that, you know, there's a certain element of um, his own brand being a part of 
his name. Um, so I think as long as, um, and you know, once again, this is a level of your comfort. If you prefer your audience doesn't know your real name for whatever reason, that's okay. And that becomes part of, you know, what your brand is and kind of a little bit of, of the mystery to it. I don't think that really um, puts too many barriers between you and your consumers. But I wonder if anybody else feels differently about that. <laughs> I know, and, and naming things is, is a weird experience. I think um, I share a name with some relatively successful Australian boxer, which um, comes into a whole deal of when you're trying to set up your marketing and make sure that you're easy to find on the internet. Um, I think that's when those questions are really more important than necessarily when you're connecting directly with your audience. <laughs> I would I would read that novel <laughs> but you also have to go meet this person I think mm -hmm. I'm I'm a ZAC Zach too and as is he so eventually we're gonna have to fight for supremacy but I don't like my odds <laughs> against the uh the middleweight champion of Australia come on man oh man I want to hop back up to Elizabeth's question about um strategies basically for social media uh yes and no I think that we have talked a lot about ways to drive this towards social media, but things like this also can be used when you're out and about in real life. And that just comes in with, you know, standing, standing in your values all the time. And while you're talking to people, while you're having conversations with people, like allowing them to connect with you on that personal level and like know you, if that makes sense. But yes, we are talking very heavily geared towards social media right now, Elizabeth. But also if you have questions about like in-person strategies and things like that, we can totally touch on that as well. Kayla, do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, Mary's question here as far as yes. uh, I think with brings up a lot of interesting things as far as posting frequency and how long does this process actually take? Both of which very yes. valid questions. Yes. So recently I saw something, it was a statistic and I hate bringing up statistics when it comes to social media, because I think it's so case by case, but um, that I saw a statistic recently that said, if you have under a hundred followers, you should be posting 14 times a week, which is miserable. Um, if you have under a thousand followers, you should be posting like five times a week. And then anything over 10,000 was once a week. So it depends a little bit on how many followers you have. So what I'm going to tell you is that you need to post as often as it feels good for you. So if you sit down and give yourself a goal of posting seven days a week, but that gives you anxiety, don't make that your goal because you won't do it. If it feels more digestible to say, I'm going to post three times a week and you'll actually, you'll, you'll get up and do it that's perfect. Do that. I am one of those people that I really like to create big, elaborate, complicated strategies and I do it to myself. And then I don't do it for myself <laughs> because it's so much. And, um, I just, you just need to, you need to do what feels good to you. And I get that that's kind of a, an annoying answer to receive. But I would do some soul searching around that. I would recommend that for everybody. Sit down and give yourself a goal. Try it out for three weeks. If you don't hit it, you know, decide if that's some amount of discernment or if you need to switch up your strategy. Um, how long does it take to achieve super fans? That is an excellent question. And the answer is also super annoying. It depends. <laughs> so we live in this weird time on the internet where stuff goes viral for no real reason. There's so much stuff on the internet right now that gets popularized and there's no way to know what's going to do it. As far as achieving super fan, it can be as quick as someone stumbles upon your stuff, they see it once, they fall in love with it, they tell everyone they know, and you have already a super fan. So it depends on how vulnerable you are, how clear your values are, and how easy it is for people to identify and connect with those values. So I would say, give yourself some time, doesn't happen overnight. 
also understand that it's not something that you like arrive to. It's not like, oh great, now I have this amazing audience, I can stop. It is, it's something that you have to chip away at. And I, I wish I could give you a timeline, but I just, unless Zach, you disagree, I just don't think there is one. Right, I think, and there's a couple of different things that go into it. Um, you know, if you wanna look at it um, on a simple, you know, the most basic way you could look at it is that if you're able to get one every day, it'll take you about three years. Um, but that, you know, per day super fan, I think is a really hard thing as creatives to um, wrap your head around because all of us are in different industries and we're producing content at different rates. Um, you know, I think that, you know, your best chance of finding these fans is when you're pushing out something new and exciting and doing whatever promotion is involved with that. Um, Kayla said something interesting that I want to touch on is this idea of going viral, which would be, you know, what a great idea. Like you wake up tomorrow and this thing you made has just blown up on the internet. And now there's thousands and thousands of people who are looking at it. Um, you know, that's kind of a nice idea. Um, I think there's a dark side to it as well in that when you suddenly become exposed to this, you know, massively diverse group of people that are on the internet, um, you know, you might find some people that really, really love what you do, but you're also going to have to take the people on the other side that hate what you do and will do anything they can to make sure that you know that they hate what you do, which it just comes with the game of being, you know, putting something out in the public sphere that's always going to happen. Um, the flip side is when you're building slowly and steadily, that whole time you're surrounded by these super fans that have this very genuine and honest appreciation of what you do. And so even if your goal is to get to a thousand, you know, think about what it's like to have, you know, even a hundred people, you're 10% of your goal, but you have a hundred people that genuinely love what you do. And you know that you've made a positive impact in your life and you're constantly surrounded by this community and this audience that you get to interact with. Um, and as much as that entails, you know, a longer timeline and more work, there's also, I think, something to be said for being in that genuine and appreciative community of what you do so the shorter answer is uh how long does it take to achieve our super fans a while and it takes as long as it takes but if you approach it um intentionally and with an eye on the journey rather than the destination um i think the the path there becomes a lot more enjoyable to get to so hope that answers your question <laughs> I know that, that's a tough one um but she also she's got her Mary's got a great question as well um how do you know who is your super fan which I adore this question because there's somebody who very very likely is lurking in the shadows they are not engaging with your content at all but they are telling everyone they know about you I like to call those people lurkers I am one of those people. I do that all the time. I have people that I never interact with their stuff, but I still tell everyone about them. A super fan is someone that connects with you. They connect with what you care about. They connect with your values. They connect with your mission. They connect with your work. And there's someone who will tell anyone who will listen about you and what you do. And you might never meet this person. You might never hear from them. But all of a sudden, maybe you get a random spike in interest in your stuff. Um, a super fan is, an ambassador is official. So an ambassador is someone who gets some sort of benefit for telling other people about you. A super fan is someone who just literally cares so much about what you're doing that they can't help but talk about it and spread the word about it. And sometimes, <laughs> this is, this is going to be frustrating to hear, sometimes they buy from you and sometimes they do not. Sometimes they're just people who maybe can't or they have, they have whatever is limiting them from purchasing from you, but they still care so much about you and what you're doing. So you have to have it in your head that these people still have a place in the community that you are creating around you and your work, if that makes sense. Very obscure also, I apologize. Right, 
yeah, I think there is there is an important to remember that you are going to have fans. You're going to have your regular fans as well. Um, probably, you know, if you have 100 super fans, you're probably going to have two or three times as many of those who are just regular fans who enjoy what you do, are going to stop in now and then, um, and, you know, get a little dopamine hit out of whatever you're doing, and then they're going to move on. But your super fans are those very select, you know, top 1% of people who will buy everything you do, who absolutely adore, and like, you are this touchstone in their life. Um, Ooh, Renee asked a great question about inauthenticity in social posts, um, which I know when I feel it, um, but I, Kayla's got a lot more experience in this. And I wonder if, uh, if you have anything to say about that. To me, inauthenticity is an intentional untruth to elicit a certain reaction. That is, to me, inauthenticity. So people a lot of the times think of authenticity as bearing your entire soul. I disagree. I think authenticity is about ch choosing what parts of yourself you are going to share and being 100% truthful about that. So it doesn't mean, you know, sharing that your kitchen's dirty or share unless you choose that, but like sharing that you had a bad day or sharing that you got a f in a fight with your neighbor or what have you. It's not necessarily that, like you don't have to like live tweet your stream of consciousness, but to me, being authentic on social media just means being true to whatever parts of yourself that you are choosing to share and to not bend the truth or create, build some sort of false image around what you're doing or what you care about or what your life is like. Mm -hmm. And I always think yeah, about it as, it. yeah, I, I think about it as performing when you get on social media and you're performing to meet this, you know, this expectation you have of this is how people look on social media, or this is how, you know, artists should sound when they say this. Um, Cause I think it's easy to fall into that trap because it, it helps kind of create a little bit of um, a guard around, around you. And Kayla said, use the word vulnerability, which I think is so important. It's part of our job as artists is to be vulnerable. Um, but not just when we're making things, you know, it's also when we're interacting with, um, with our fans. Um, and I think for me, that's where inauthenticity comes in is when you're trying to put on this performance of this is what I should look like on social media, rather than just being genuinely who you are and letting people, letting people come up against that. And the people that um, enjoy it and resonate with the same things that resonate with you will stick around and the other people will just bounce off and go on their way and you won't have to worry about uh, trolls as Michelle said. <laughs> Do we have any more questions, comments, concerns in this kind of area of topic? This is a great discussion. So I appreciate all of your questions. Thank you. No. Okay. All right. So why the heck does all of this stuff work? I love to use this example. I'm sure Zach's sick of me saying it, but like 15 years ago before social media was really a big thing, small businesses oftentimes had to look like big businesses. And I think the same goes for artists. You had to look and appear on the outside as though you were already super successful because people were untrusting of the smaller business or the independent artist. And now the script has totally flipped. <laughs> and I would say the majority of people are more trusting of small businesses where they know who they're purchasing from. They know where their money's going. And I think it would, a lot goes the same for artists in the sense of they wanna support you as a human. They know that supporting you puts food on your table or provides for your family. And people feel good about that. People are learning that they can feel good about where they spend their money. And that's why this whole thing works because by building these relationships inside of your marketing, whether that's at a gallery where you have a super vulnerable conversation with somebody, whether that's online where you bring someone into your home and into your process, whether that's going live and just answering questions about who you are as a person, those sort of, that connection helps people decide that you're like worth supporting 
not worth, that's a bad choice of words. You are someone that they would like to support. You are someone that they want to connect with further. You're someone that they want to see succeed because they appreciate your mission. And that's why this whole thing works. Anyone have anything to say about that? Zen. No, that was great, Kayla. Um, and honestly, I think this would be an awesome opportunity as we have a big, a good sized group of artists and creatives in here for us to just have a chance to talk about our experiences with marketing and with building relationships with our audience um, and kind of the different challenges that we come up against when you have to move from being that in that creative and artistic space into that more entrepreneurial business space because there's there's overlap and there's you know and there's gaps in there as well so i'd love to turn it over to the room and just be able to have kind of an open discussion about you know our experiences in this area can i jump in real quick before we do that okay cool. i just I have to do the thing oh okay do the thing. so <laughs> before we go into the open conversation part um if you at all have more questions, if you're interested in learning more from me or Zach about this topic, um, you there hopefully will be, I believe, a section on the survey where you can fill out that you would like to talk to us. Um, we can set up like a 30 minute call and just hang out, chat, ask any questions you want. Um, we also do have a marketing course that is available if anyone is interested in that. And we are in the beta of a, um, personal branding course. So that'll be at a reduced price the first time we run it. So if any of y'all are interested in that, I think it would be super helpful um, just because as artists, you are a walking personal brand. So anywho, that's that. I just had to get that out of the way. <laughs> and now I would love to have an open conversation. Yes. Renee said seasonality, which I've been thinking about a lot. Um, Renee, if you're comfortable, I'd love to hear kind of what your um approach this is because this is something that's been rattling around in my head a lot uh yes uh, can you hear me okay yes sir great um it's just one of those things where like it can be so hard and we've seen many people um in the in the chat talk about not finding time not finding um, um uh, you know priorities in their days to be able to post online and it's exhausting but i i you know the if everybody remembers that feeling when you get out of college and you have to start working a nine to five job and all of a sudden you're like wait a minute there's no summers anymore <laughs> there's no and so and and if you if you kind of start tying your creative outputs to a seasonality um you can have breaks uh and those breaks can be refreshing those breaks can be good for for so that you know distance makes the heart grow fonder and so as i ramp up on 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 really really engaging online through either patreon um, or newsletters even just regular social media i i want to be open about saying you know uh, uh i'm taking this month off because i'm going to spend time with family and things of that nature i think can help in aligning yourself with seasons it doesn't have to be the four seasons but it but it uh, can be similar or the school year that can give yourself a break uh, and help you recharge, but then come back stronger and come back more consistently and not get uh, uh, burnt out. So that's, that's what I mean by seasonality. Yeah, totally. I, I run into this a lot. Um, so being a, being a writer, there's this adage that um, you need to be doing it every single day if you want to get better at it, which I think is true. But then there also comes the point where, um, where I'm approaching where it's like, okay, well, I need to start looking at marketing and, you know, doing the business side of things, how do I balance that without this guilt of, uh oh, I didn't write today, I worked on this other part of it. And I think this, I, this seasonality approach to it makes a lot of sense. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Anybody else have experience with that? Or anything else that they want to uh, tack on to the end of that? Ooh. Jim, great question. A visual arts fundraising program for veterans. That's fascinating. What yourself? I love that question. I think that there is a different strategy because you have that mission already behind you. So it's super easy to overt, overt, be super overt. That was really hard to get out. Um, be super overt about what you're doing. You can just be so upfront about your mission and so transparent 
versus it doesn't necessarily, so it doesn't have to be nearly as focused on you, which, you know, obviously, but um, this allows you to kind of, you can dive into these stories of these veterans. You can look into that and ask them if they're willing to come forward and speak on some of this stuff. You, I'm just getting all excited. Um, but I think that if you shift a lens a little bit, so instead of, you still wanna be having this goal of relationship building and connecting with people, but you don't necessarily want to have this, what am I trying to say? You don't necessarily need to bring humans directly into like your home, right? You can bring people into the creative process just how you would, but you can also shift the spotlight if that makes sense. Yeah, perfectly said, Kayla. Um, Jim, that's, I think that's really interesting and I've, I've done similar work. Um, I come from a background in public relations. Um, and I've done a lot of this similar work um, on nonprofits that are um, veteran centered. And I think Kayla nailed it that um, everything we talked about is sort of um, based on the idea of the individual artist. When, um, you're, when you're moving to this idea of, of a nonprofit specifically around veterans, um, that individual story we talked about as far as artists becomes the story of the veterans and giving people the opportunity to connect with their stories and understand what they went through um, in this journey of theirs and having them brush up against that version of the story rather than whatever the specific nonprofit story is, which I think is still has a place and is important. Uh, but just from my experience working in uh, veteran centered nonprofits, um, that's what really resonates with people. And, you know, there's always room in your community papers and the stories around you to talk about that, especially when there's a visual element to it. Um, uh, like it is these portraits. I had the opportunity to work with um, uh, when President Bush did his um, um, portraits of courage, he called it, which was uh, his paintings he did of um, veterans of the wars in the Middle East. Um, this was something that we came into a lot was how do we tell these, you know, the opportunity, how do we find opportunities to just tell the stories of these veterans and then show, you know, these portraits that kind of reflect this, this journey they went on. And so little of what we talked about was the gallery itself or President Bush's work with it. It was all solely focused on what the store are on the veterans. So that's exciting. I'd love to hear more about that from you at some time, Jim. Ooh, right. strategies. Go ahead, Gail. Oh, yeah. No, you go ahead. No, I'll just scroll through the chat here. Um, strategies for getting people into a gallery. Um, great question, Elizabeth. Um, I'd love to, can you tell me a little bit more about what the gallery is like, um, kind of what some of your work entails, just so I can get a better sense of um, kind of what you're, what you're facing? Great. I know some people are kind of making their way out, so we really appreciate everybody who's had time to, to hang out with us today and definitely look forward to any of your other questions or comments as this exit survey goes out. So appreciate everybody who's been able to stick around this long. Oh, in Rhino. That's cool. I love Rhino. Um, oh, this is cool. I'm curious, Elizabeth, just, <laughs> I don't want to grill you. I'm curious how, um, A, how much control do you have in the gallery setting? Like, is it possible for you to like find power partners to work with? Like, I don't know, a food truck? <laughs> um, I'm not the gallery owner. I'm just a represented artist. Actually, she was gonna be on this call, but she's not. Um, it's foolproof contemporary art in Rhino. Um, but I don't know what else to tell you other than it's all contemporary art. Okay. Um, you know, she's in a really great area as far as, you know, an up and coming part of Denver, but how would you attract people? I don't know. Maybe I should make it personal and say, how would I attract people to come in and see abstract art in this gallery? <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I, I appreciate, 
I appreciate the question. Um, I think there's so many different angles that you can take this from. Um, the first thing for me that comes to mind is creating some sort of partnership, whether that be with, um, like I said, like a, maybe having a food truck outside to where there you work out something with the food truck where people get a discount after going into the gallery or things like that where it's related enough to where people that are interested will come. Um, I think that I there's right next door to a new, uh, I don't know, like craft bar. Ooh. So I don't know how, uh, how she'd react to a food truck, but I'll right. run it by it. Does she have any sort, do you have any sort of connection with the new bar next door? Is there, do you guys have partnership work out there? Perfect. Yeah, they own the building, so they, okay. they're their tenants. <laughs> yeah. There's a connection, you know, right. you can go through the, the bar into the gallery through an entrance. That's awesome. I would suggest um, working out some kind of agreement with them where people in the bar get a discount when they head over and maybe vice versa. Um, just having relationships like that with your neighbors where y'all can kind of promote each other. Maybe, I don't know, I don't know how risky it would be to chuck some pieces over there that, pe that could just be super interesting for people to talk about. Um, I don't know if that's like, you know, art around food and drinks is not in my head, a great idea. However, it might be something that could work. Um, just getting creative about things like that so that you're not just trying to get people to move off of social media into the gallery. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? It's a strategy, I don't know. Um, I saw there's a gallery in Denver that did they had a show around the theme, but they did videos of artists talk, I mean, short videos of artists talking about their work to kind of promote it on their website. What do you, do you think that's a good? Yeah, absolutely. That totally makes, that creates an instant connection. Video online is so much more powerful nowadays and it just, it does create an instant connection with the artist. Mm -hmm. Zach, I'm curious what you have. Yeah, um, one thing that popped into my head as you were talking about that um, is, and something that always helps me is, is thinking about um, what kind of contribution can you make to the people that you are looking to bring into your gallery? Um, one interesting idea that popped into my head too would be the idea of finding um, some classes that are, that are teaching people who are maybe interested in creating abstract art. Um, and if they would let you maybe lead a guest class, I know that if this was something that I was interested in pursuing as a hobby, and I had somebody um, a, who was an established abstract artist who was, you know, being um, shown in galleries come in and, and teach our class and give us a couple tips and pointers. Um, not only does that feel like I get a lot out of it, but it also introduces you to a group of people who are distinctly interested in what you do. And lets you talk about, hey, you know, if this is something that you're interested in, you know, I've got this exhibit up in, you know, gallery A, B, or C, come check it out. You know, if you want any, you know, if you have any questions about your own process or my process, what you can do to become a better artist, you know, DM me on Instagram or follow me on social media. Um, and really just finding ways that you can connect directly with people that are interested in your type of art in your area, I think would be a good place to start. Okay. Um, are you familiar with Priya Parker's book, The Art of Gathering, how she mm -hmm. creates these people's interest in coming to together? I don't know. She's got a lot of different strategies in there, but um, maybe, you know, as I'm listening to you talk about making these personal connections, I'm thinking maybe a meet the artist, um, open house at the gallery. I don't know. I think that's a great that's idea. A great idea. Yeah, everyone does want to meet the person behind the masterpiece. I think that's a fascinating experience for people. And you said that book was called The Art of the The Art of Gathering, is that right? Yeah. Okay, interesting. Check that out. Yeah, I think Elizabeth there's so much room to be super creative in the position that you're in. 
Um, I think that when you, when you're in a position where you have so many things that you could try, oftentimes it feels just a little bit like, oh, I don't know which one's right and I don't know what to do. So I would, we, we practice this thing at Kite and Dart just called do it anyway. So it's just kind of taking a leap just in a direction. And the only way you're gonna find out if that was the best thing to do is if you try it. So I would say, honestly, start with that idea of the meet the artist start with that and see how you go on. I would just open up a conversation about creating a partnership with the bar next door, whatever that could look like. And then third piece of homework, what Zach said, I would just look into what it might take to have a class, whether it's hosted at the gallery. There are so many great spaces in Rhino, you might be able to host it down the street and then go for a field trip to the gallery. You know what I mean? So I would, just, I would just take a leap and just kind of start the conversation for at least one of those things, you know, because it can be so paralyzing to want to pick the correct thing. But at the end of the day, you're not going to know until you just kind of jump in. Yeah, you're giving me a lot of ideas. It could also be instead of having someone make abstract art, you could say, you know, you ever wanted to explore explore this type of artwork, come to the gallery and you can have an interactive conversation where the artist helps you understand abstract art or I don't know. I don't know, but you're giving me a lot of ideas. So thank you. Good. I'm glad. Glad to hear it. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Elizabeth. This is so fun to me to have so many different um, disciplines in here. Um, abstract artists and not and people who run nonprofits and chefs and musicians that just I love you know being able to get in a room because it's all there's so many differences in our different um you know crafts but so many similarities as well that I just I, don't know, I find this really really fun um anybody else any other comments um ideas thoughts that this conversation has brought up for you I'm just reading the comments. Yeah. Cool. If no one else has anything that they would like to discuss, I I just want to oh. Jim. Yeah. How to get the word out and to who? That's mm -hmm. great. Um, how to get the word out is just to start, honestly. Um social media newsletters zach is well diversed in what he calls earned media so i'd love if you could just talk about that for a second yeah um earned media is a term that i because uh you know i mentioned earlier that i come from a background in public relations public relations is this weird word that um people attribute a lot of different things to so i like to call it earned media which is all about you know doing something good and, and talking about it um and jim like where you're coming from um, that has an audience built into it when you're when you're doing anything that's in support of veterans. Um, what I would recommend is reaching out to, I mean, obviously everything that Kayla's talking about as far as social media, newsletters, and, and making sure that the audience you already have is aware of it. Um, when you're trying to get the word out to a larger audience, um, especially something like this, which is, it sounds to me like it's a portrait gallery, um, is definitely just worth letting all your local media know whether that's um, newspapers, TV stations, radio, um, which also, it's funny though, how old fashioned that can sound um, in this day and age, but it still has a massive audience. Um, and so if you can put together, whether it's press release or you know what I call a media advisory um, to let people know, uh, or, or to rather let these stations and these outlets know that there's something interesting going on that their audience uh, may wanna come see, um, that is an incredible amount of, um, free marketing, essentially, if you do it right. Um, and it's really going to uh, give people the opportunity to come in contact with it in ways that they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, and the great thing about that, too, is that people have, um, or, or at least still to some extent, um, a level of respect for their local media, um, especially when it's not specifically an advertisement. Um, there is a certain level of trust that comes into that that you don't always see on the national scale 
or when you're flipping through, you know, advertisements in a magazine, when it's something your local anchor or reporter or radio jockey is talking about, it it lends a little bit more credibility to it. So that's definitely something that I would recommend. Go do some research on what your local um, outlets are um, and start getting the word out to them and letting them know that this is going on. Um, it's something we can totally talk about um, offline as well if you'd like some more uh, detailed advice on it. I, I wrote your email down, so I'll go, go ahead and shoot you a note later on, Jim. So we'll be sure to, we'll be sure to dive into that. Yeah, and honestly, as far as the to who you're talking to, a challenge that I would like to throw out is to sit down and kind of archetype a single human being that would be interested in this. Where would you find this person? How would how do they behave in real life? What what are they interested in? Um, just sit down and create an archetype of a single human being. And then from there, there's obviously more than one person that's going to fit into that. But having that super specific, like this person cares about these different things, this person, you know, spends a lot of time in the mountains, I don't know. Um, and you just create kind of an archetype around that. So then as you're speaking, it feels like a one-on-one -on -one conversation to the humans that identify with what you're doing. That's a challenge that I love to throw out to people. And I think it can be super powerful. Um, but yeah, as far as getting the word out, it's so much just talking about it. It sounds simple. It's not, but you just start. And a lot of times as you start, it'll get rolling. Yeah. Angela has a great question here. Um, about, well, A, I'm interested in hearing more about this Athena project, um, but talking about, and if I'm understanding this right, uh, your organization specifically kind of creates these events that um, gives um, women and female artists the opportunity to come in and, and create this art. Um, am I getting that right? Yeah, so we, we end up doing a lot of um, collaborations with other entities, and so we partner with them to be able to then um, hire women artists to do the work. So we're uh, many different things. One of the language I would use is like we're a bridge, we're a platform, um, we help um, new artists get connected, we help professional artists um, connect with community members who are, are women artists. And, um, you know, in, in listening to you talk today, like a lot of this sounds like good strategy for individual artists that are trying to, they're already creating content, for example, mm -hmm. because they're already doing the work. Well, the work that we do is about the events themselves. It's not like we're creating pottery, we're not creating music. And so one of the things I struggle with is how do we show our story without ultimately the story ends up being about the event that we did and it's sort of after the fact it's the here's here's what we've accomplished but there's not a lot of time to do the the sharing of it along the way and right. so it just occurred to me that if if we looked at it from literally like what i do as a producer is i'm creating an event is that a story that's that's worth trying to capture or put a lens on and and is it's something that you've already seen done? Like I just couldn't think of an organization that that kind of talks about the organization as the artist <laughs> is what I, I was trying to do. No, that's a great question. Um, and this is something I've got some experience in. Um, really the, the short answer is that um, the stories that you're telling are going to be um, about the artists themselves and the work they do and the, the impact that's had on them and the people in their lives. Um, if I was you, I would make sure that um, in those stories, Athena is always framed as this platform and this connector that makes those stories happen. Um, but, and this kind of comes back to what I was talking about uh, regarding Jim's work. Um, when that comes to this idea of earned media and talking about it you know, in, in local and national stages, um, outlets never like to specifically talk about your organization. They'll always tell you, hey, our advertising department's over here if you wanna talk about yourself. But if you go in by leading, talking about the stories of the women you're working with and the, the personal impacts that has, the Athena Project will work its way in there naturally as sort of the, the platform that lifts these, these creatives up. Uh, but the story should be about them specifically. Um, and it sounded to me like you were talking about, okay, well, I have this event coming up. How do I do some kind of get people interested in it um, beforehand rather than only talking about it retroactively? 
Um, and I think that's a great place to draw on those stories from previous events um, and be able to kind of trickle those out over time and say, hey, at our last event, we, you know, had this, you know, amazing artist who created this installation that, you know, kind of communicated A, B, or C. Um, and use that as a lead in to your next event. And that's, so that kind of can serve as your call to action that, you know, at the end of this story, hey, you know, these amazing opportunities happen all the time at our events, you know, our next one is here. Um, if you are interested, or if, you know, you know somebody who is, come check it out, RSVP, you know, whatever that specific call to action is, but really lean on those individual artist stories as your organization stories, and that you are kind of this place that can connect people and help create these opportunities, um, but really using those personal experiences as the touchstones of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Then, then the challenge just becomes getting the artists to loop us into that communication <laughs> early right. enough to be able to do that. Um, and that's, that's also a challenge is just the time, the time aspect yeah. of it. And that may be something that has to be, um, you know, worked on with your, your in-house processes as far as, you know, when you're bringing in these artists, you know, what level of communication do you expect from them um, as far as, you know, their availability for maybe speaking with media or for promoting you on their personal social media pages and vice versa. Um, anything you have to say about that, Kayla? Well, I think sometimes um, you can frame it to the artist as like basically everything we've talked about in here. So you can say to the artist, if you share this story with us, we're going to be like, it's going to be free publicity for you when you share this story with us versus if we just say so-and-so is here. You know what I mean? So if you frame that as a win-win for everybody, you might have more luck. Um, but kind of to piggyback off of what Zach was saying and to tie into your question, people will care about the art of putting together an event. And I think you don't have to share it in depth of like, oh, well, today I'm sending emails and this and that, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but you can kind of give fun updates. You know, we like, let's just say you're trying to, I'm making up a scenario. You're trying to create an outdoor art gallery, like pop-up thing in a park. So you can say like, oh, we toured three different parks today and we think we found the venue, like stay tuned, things like that, where people are like, they get to go on the journey with you and see it build with you. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, just signed another artist today. Can't wait to announce it. Things like that, where people yeah. are like, oh, I wonder who it is. I can't wait to see that type of thing. I would say that there's room on like social media or newsletters for that sort of content as well. Okay. And have you seen other organizations do that? Like, do you, do you know of anybody that's telling that story? So, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Zach. I was going to say, I did some work. Um, I, I'm here in Phoenix. Um, uh, one of my previous clients was the Arizona Science Center. Um, and something similar we did was um, as we were preparing, uh, they were going to unveil the largest complete T-Rex skeleton um, that had ever been found. Or, sorry, second <gasps> largest behind um, Sue in Chicago. Um, but what we did as we assembled this whole exhibit on the upper floor is we had, um, we did a couple different things. Like we had a live, um, camera that you could, um, that people could watch kind of as, um, the T-Rex was assembled. Um, that also got kind of combined with a time-lapse that we used on social media of this exhibit going from nothing to this massive interactive thing. Um, so I, I definitely think there's, um, there's a place for those kind of behind the scenes stories. Because for you, what I'm hearing is that you sort of have these two different potential audiences. You A, have um, artists, um, people who want to create the art, but then you also have people who are interested in the fact there's an organization like you that supports artists like this. Um, and so really th what I just talked about is kind of an example of bringing in uh, the latter group of people who like to see how organizations can support other artists and what it takes to pull all this together. Because there's this whole event management community that, that loves that and is constantly coming up against the same kind of challenges that you are. Um, and so I think if you can reach out to them and connect and build relationships with people in that community, as well as the artistic community, um, you'll have a cool marriage um, in your audience. Was there something else, Kayla, that you were? Um, I was going to say, similarly to Zach, I've seen it done just in different ways. Um, 
but I think there's always opportunity. We have to remember that the world is super abundant and everyone's always done something. So like, yes, I'm sure there are people that have done it. And I think if you put yourself into it and your spin on it, people are going to love it because they're going to get to know you, which helps them trust the organization more. Even if I'm an artist on the outside looking in and maybe you know, I've had some experiences, so now I'm super nervous and discerning of these types of situations, but I get to know you, then I'm interested in getting involved. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I hope yeah. that was helpful. Thank you both. Yeah. <laughs> and Zach, you, you hit on exactly our constant struggle of artist, art, audience, artist, mm -hmm. audience. Yeah. <laughs> Who are we speaking to? And on, yeah, I, I mean, and I would encourage you to, to not think about it as either or, you know, at, at Kind Art, we always like to say, you know, move past either or and move over to both and, um, that there's no reason that there, that there can't be, you know, room for both of them in your community. Awesome. Cool. These are great questions, everybody. This has been a lot of fun. Um, I know we, we said 1230 was going to be our... Well, 130 for us, 1230 for Oh, yeah, you know, Phoenix, hour behind, so everybody... <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else any other final comments questions thoughts um, from everybody in the room three minutes I really appreciate y'all for coming today and for engaging as much as you have this has yes. been awesome um, that yeah I just really appreciate it and it's always great to come into a room with people that are engaging and asking questions and kind of challenging the, um, what's the word, content, mm, challenging the curriculum, like just asking so many questions. It makes it for such a fun experience. So thank you all so much. I had a super good time today with yes, all of you. You all have been great. Yeah, like Kayla said, it's, it's not fun when I come in and just look at my little narcissistic corner of myself and just talk to myself the whole time. I love being able to interact with you all and, and hear the different challenges and solutions that you guys are, are coming up against. So thanks again to everybody for, for taking the time out of their day to join us. Hope you got something and, good out of it. And thank you to Kayla and Zach and the Kite and Dark Group. Thank you for uh, sharing such wonderful content with us today and information and, and answering those, those tough questions. Um, this was really such an engaging conversation. We look forward to sharing the recording um, and staying in touch with you all. So uh, have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Muchas gracias. <laughs>